Tarver, and what I kind of added in when Joe asked me to do this, said, why do I even deserve an opinion on this? I don't do it, and I'm not a cardiac surgeon, and I'm not a cardiologist. Well, I kind of get involved in it because of my role as the medical director of the Heart and Vascular Center, and so that's supposedly a non-partisan role, and the chairman of the CV surgery part is some certainly partisan, and we have a very busy Tarver uh, program. So let's begin with the story and um, in terms of who should be doing it. And we did not get involved in the original Edwards trial and that was probably partly my responsibility because I thought what we should do is bring everybody together, all the surgeons, all the cardiologists, and we'd sit and pitch to Edwards and it was a complete dog show to be completely honest with you. And if I was Edwards, I would have walked away from our institution too. So we kind of scratched our heads and wondered, how, how do we screw this up that badly? And then along came Corvalve, and it would have been absolutely devastating had we not been involved in it. And by this time, I can figure out some of the, a little bit more wisdom when we pared it down to the key characters who were going to be representing us. And we made sure we were all going to be speaking with the same voice because not everybody believed in the technology up front. And the first thing you learn is when you're actually pitching to a company, it's best to kind of at least show some optimism that there's a, there's a possibility that we'll actually get that. So these are um, two of my partners, uh, and I say Neil Kleiman is an interventional cardiologist. He heads the cat lab. We're highly integrated with our cardiology department, and on your right is uh, Mike Reardon. And so they are the, the PIs basically on this trial, and they lead it. And we decided up front that we would have a maximum number of two surgeons and two cardiologists who were going to be involved in this. And Neil's kind of got pretty strong opinions, and he thought this should be done in the cat lab. <clears throat> Another mistake on my behalf. However, that's how the story begins. Because the story begins that there were two cases, first day in the cat lab, um, and one of my other partners came down and says, have you seen what's happening up in the cat lab? I said, oh my lord. And they had to go on pump in the middle of the case because of a ruptured left ventricle. And dog show would be an insult to dogs in terms of basically what was going on at that point in time. However, the patient actually survived and I called up Mike Quinones who was the chair of cardiology because they at this point had already sent for the next patient and uh, very enthusiastic about moving along. I said, oh, 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 time out here. We need to sit down and, and talk to the team. And we sat him down and said, no, 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 ain't doing this next case. And there was great consternation amongst the team. And, but we agreed to halt, we explained to the patient, and we kind of reconnoitered, and we thought this should move down in the end of the hybrid room. Mm -hmm. And it's been in the hybrid rooms ever since. It's very interesting to hear that that's what's going on across the country. And you know, the way we basically run, the hybrid rooms belong to our organization, as did the cat labs. And so what we try now to do is track the hybrid rooms do not belong to the surgeons, and the cath labs don't belong to the cardiologists. And so what we do is we try to track the most appropriate case to the most appropriate interventional suites. And to this day, we still think that, that the, the, the percutaneous files are best done in the hybrid room. And it's more a matter of making the cardiologists comfortable. They now think nothing, basically, of coming down into an operating room. That may come back to haunt us in the future, but, but I think we regard that as a success story. They bring the cath lab teams down, and this has been an explosive increase um, in the number of ratio percutaneous valves that have been done. And these guys have done a tremendous job after a slightly shaky start of, of getting this program on track basically into leading it. And so some of the challenges that we now face is that, I think you've heard from Dr. Edwards that a lot of evidence, this is here to stay, it is here to stay, it's, not, it's irrefutable it's here to stay. The magnitude of the impact on our surgical volume is what really is going to be determined you know, over the course of the next couple of years. Now, to date, this has not impacted our surgical volume. In fact, this has drafted our surgical volume. And one of the challenges is that um, right now, if you don't have a percutaneous valve program, you're not going to have a valve program. And so it is, it's highly competitive to get involved really in these clinical trials really at, a, at, at an early stage. And the drafting effect is truly enormous. And so the way we kind of set this up in the organization is we have one team. Um, and other places don't. They have two different teams. They all book cases separately. And we have maintained the fact that we've got one team. That doesn't mean the same two guys who started this program exclusively had that. We have one team. We have one valve conference. We have one clinic. And we incrementally add people basically onto that team. But we'll not allow basically there to be separate teams basically who are booking cases independently. They all basically channel through this. And that's the way we think that we've maintained basically some of the results. The payoffs that occur for this have essentially been huge. 
Um, Mike Reardon is the national PI on two of the main clinical trials, which are basically ongoing and coming down the line. Um, these are the most financially lucrative clinical trials that have ever been run in our organization. And so these are big bucks that can come into the organization, you see, along with this. It drives your prestige and it lets us recruit additional people to come and get involved in it. And the life cycle, and so it's very interesting to hear Dr. Edwards talking about how reimbursement has now been structured around the composition, basically, of the teams, the preclinical evaluation, basically, and, the way, and how these cases are going to be performed. First time this really happened was around carotid stenting. In carotid stenting, I think there was great fear among CMS that with carotid stenting, there was going to be this huge explosion uh, in the number of carotid stents that were going to be, uh, going to be utilized. In, you know, I'd say this even the cardiology group, that is driven by fear of the cardiologist. Surgeons basically have been treating carotid disease for a long period of time and have limited the number of carotid endorectomies, for example, being performed to those with very stringent indications. And as carotid standing came on board, basically, we also controlled that to almost exactly the same indications. The concern was that this is suddenly approved and reimbursed that this would lead to an explosive overutilization of that. And the concern, much like TAVR, is the effect of stroke. And another one of Dr. Rever's comments is, I'm very interested in stroke because of transcranial DAPA as a complication, basically, of these procedures. Maybe we'll come back and talk about this. And so what CMS did, basically, is they lined up reimbursement along the IDE clinical trials. And to date, you can only get carotid stents approved by CMS, basically, for high-risk patients, definition for high-risk patients, symptomatic, under age 80. Interestingly, the older patients did better with carotid endarterectomy. And carotid stenting is essentially held where it was at the time of these IDE trials. It has not undergone this explosion, largely because the reimbursement is strictly controlled. And that basically led me on to kind of remember the golden rule, basically. The golden rule is he who has the gold rules. And they're going to set basically these, the, the parameters as regards how you're going to approve these patients and how you're going to actually reimburse these patients. And this was kind of one of the early uh, missives that came out basically of CMS talking basically about how it was going to be uh, controlled. But uh, you can see as TAVR basically has been approved. So there's great interest both from a financial standpoint basically and also a regulatory standpoint. And there are multiple different clinical guidelines that are out there. Uh, which uh, prove basically the teams based upon a variety of different components. The uh, credential basically with knowledge and skills, and that's defined, the facilities that are required in an organization, other institutional resources, such as the database. I think about Dr. Edwards frequently. I never knew very little about SDS until I kind of moved into this position. And now I eat, sleep, and breathe it on a daily basis. And I'm often talking about the vascular registries because SVS has a vascular registry. The difference basically is the quality of the data that's been entered into the SDS. And the difference to that is the amount of money it costs our organization. It's about a quarter of a million dollars a year that we spend uh, hiring coordinators who enter that data. But the payoff is they're independent of us. SVS, we put in our own data. Probably means it's worthless, quite honestly. SDS, you know, we have independent, well trained data extractors, and that really is what's led to it. But the Heart Center for our, in our organization, we run like 40 to 50 different databases, so it's a real challenge in trying to even expand this. And in fact, what we're trying to do basically is reduce the number of databases that we're supporting, and we'll see basically how that ends up growing. So we look at some of the criteria which have been established really around this and start off with talking about. <clears throat> Uh, an important issue in the establishment of a transcatheter valve program is the clinical referral base for ensuring an adequate number of patients to provide for the viability of the program. You can't do this if you're only going to be doing five to ten cases a year. And the requirements basically have essentially been established. And as you review these programs, the inst institutional interventional program should have about 1,000 casts and 400 PCIs a year. Many places can do that. The TAVR interventionist should have 100 structural procedures lifetime. And I don't need to go on down through this list, but you can see how strictly you see the requirements basically of the skill level and the experience level you actually have. Now, if you look at the institutional surgical program, there are only 50 total uh, AVRs per year, for which at least 10 aortic valve replacements should be high-risk patients, again, using SDS. And so, that markedly limits the number of ECF centers that can actually uh, participate in. The challenge for us at the moment, for example, is that places like ours can easily satisfy this. But if we're going to argue now that, um, that this is equivalent, we're under pressure to broaden this out. We work in an eight-hospital system. 
and several other hospitals are very interested in growing this program. Uh, our guys are very interested in protecting the program. They've done a great job, but the natural life cycle of this is, is that we are going to have to move this out into the peripheral hospitals. And having a registry, like the TVT registry, is going to be absolutely important for us to manage incrementally bringing on these peripheral programs. They're not going to have the same volume, and the question is with the reduced volume, are we going to be able to hold the kind of outcomes that you're actually seeing here, especially as we go down basically into the lower risk groups that, that are established. So one shows the participation of the tower programs, they've got to have some way basically of ongoing monitoring. I don't need to talk about that because I think you've really already heard about what's going to be involved in here. And unlike the experience with PCI, where data tests the relationship between volume of procedures and outcome, we don't have a little of that data in the tower world, although it's certainly starting to accrue fairly rapidly. So the recommendations are constructed to ensure patient safety, obviously we all accrue to that, demonstrate there is commitment on the part of the institution to the structural heart disease program that's having this registry, and to use the existing volume as a surrogate from the established valve program to ensure patient volumes for establishment of sustainable and high quality transcatheter programs. And so we're in this situation where we are going beyond this at this point. And I'm going to lean a little bit on Mike Reardon, who's really one of the national leaders on this, and from I got some of these slides. And so he basically he said, who decides which patients in these high-risk groups are going to be involved? And this idea of the heart team really is one in which we pay a lot, a lot more than lip service to. This is, I mean, I've learned a lot actually from the way that they function. We now use their valve conference as a model for a high-risk aortic conference. Uh, because I think our patients with uh, big decisions being made about complex thoracic aortic disease or, or abdominal aortic disease deserve the same kind of scrutiny uh, that these uh, valve patients have actually had. And likewise, we have very frequently have both a cardiac surgeon and a vascular surgeon, regardless basically of what the procedure is going to be working together uh, when we're dealing basically with complex aortic problems, because it's likely the scrutiny of patient selection is one of the more important things that you're actually going to do in choosing these patients. So sometimes there's a little bit of a challenge basically in the vocabulary. When you say cardiologist says pass the wire and the surgeon says pass the wire, you tend to get two different things that are actually going to be handed to you. So, but I can tell you that watching, when, as part of the TAVR team, our surgeons are not just doing a cut down or standing around there twiddling the thumbs watching the cardiologist implant this valve. They are actively involved in it. They switch off positions so both the, the surgeon and the cardiologist get an opportunity to um, uh, participate. Interestingly, the night before last night, I walked through the operating room, there was an open aortic valve replacement being performed with a cardiology fellow scrubbed in the case because they actually wanted to see and understand it. And I think that's kind of uh, and, and the, the epitome of success basically in, in the program. And so there is a lot of cardiology we all kind of fear in some respects because of this giant um, organization issue that's moving forward. And sometimes we're, we're trying to basically hold them back a little bit. I'm not quite sure that we're ever going to get to the situation where you that it's, it's a love fest. Um, we do see things basically in a slightly different spectrum, but only I think the unified heart team approach will lead to the best results and, and to the strongest programs really that are out there. For us, it's worked better than we had initially expected. We're about to go into the era of uh, percutaneous mitral valve repair, and I don't really have time to go into the credentialing criteria. Our teams basically are now trained. This is in the here and the now, and the life cycle for this is you'll start seeing these programs crank up. You know, there are some are at the moment, but they're going to broaden this out very fairly rapidly. And so the same questions are going to be asked really of mitral valve repair. Uh, the life cycle, and the really the reason these are incredibly important to an organization is that you, you, we've heard from people like Billy Cohen this morning, it's important to be involved in the preclinical if at all possible. If you're involved in these preclinical studies and you get people who have expertise by going outside the country to get involved in it, they tend to be the ones who lead the clinical trials when they come back on shore. And after these devices get approved, I used to say that Houston, the, the, um, the model used to be you build a mountain, then you put a machine gun post in the mountain and you shot every SOB who dared to step foot on your mountain. But the reality is if, the, if you build the right mountain, everybody should be coming up that mountain. And our job in the academic organizations is, I see my job as, I'm on the next mountain. So when the guys are coming up the mountain, they get to the top and go, well, where the hell are the guys from Mathis? What happened to them? I said, well, see that mountain over there? That's the mountain that they're building at the moment. 
And once you do that, and, and you move into the educational part of this, then, then you want to become the training site where other people are going to flow through your organization. And so the life cycle of these new products, this happens once in a lifetime. It happened to me once around the aortic endographs. It's happening right now, basically, around the percutaneous valve program. These are transformational technologies. And it's critical that the surgeons really are at the table. The decisions are made in the office. If you're not in the office, you're going, to, you're going to be told what you're going to be doing. And so it's real important, and that's why allocating time basically for our folks to be in the office with the cardiologist, seeing these patients, being involved in that decision making is extremely important because they're the people basically who should be involved in doing TAVR and in future mitral valve repair. So thank you again for your attention. Appreciate the opportunity again to be here.